Hello, Edward Dodge here, uh, lostgoddess.io. In today's episode, we're going to talk about the lost myth of Gnostic Mystery Jesus. Now, this is a uh, this is a short story that I wrote. It's meant to be a thought piece. It's uh, kind of in the spirit of a Marvel Comics What If, in the spirit of the uh, multiverse. Imagine what would happen, what would, what would Western civilization be like if Christianity had taken a different form, if the, the Gnostic teachings of the early Christians, of some early Christians, had prevailed over the Orthodox teachings that became the Catholic Church? What if the resurrection of Jesus had been interpreted in the spirit of the pagan mystery traditions, of the dying, dying and rising gods that were among the most important traditions of the pagan world? Uh, these traditions that celebrate um, the, the death of a god and his return as uh, a as a conf confirmation of the turning of the seasons and uh, and the cycle of life, and these springtime resurrection festivals were nature festivals that were later co-opted by Christianity in the creation of the Easter festival. But imagine if the pagan roots of these mystery traditions had had remained. Um, imagine if. The, uh, as some people suggested, that the Eucharist, um, the Passover, not the Passover, but the Eucharist was a, was a, a psychedelic, a, a psychedelic experience vis-a-vis -vis similar to the, again, the pagan mystery traditions where we know these psychedelics were being used to celebrate ego death and, and to experience death before death. So in the spirit, um, what I've done here is I've collected sayings of Jesus from old Gnostic Gospels, um, specifically the Gospel of Philip and the Gospel of Thomas that were deemed heretical by the early church in the fourth century um, when Orthodox Christianity became the state religion of Rome and all rival traditions were banned and, and shut down with force. So all the pagan traditions and all of the, all of the Gnostic traditions were, were purged um, from, from acceptable religiosity. But they never completely went away, and and some of these texts were lost, uh, were, were were hidden and rediscovered. So the Nag Hammadi Library were a collection of texts that were buried in Egypt. Um, uh, in the fourth century, there were Coptic copies of, written in the Coptic language, but they were copies of older Greek texts that scholars uh, believe are just as old as the canonical Gospels and were floating. They were being circulated. Um, at the same time as the, as the canonical gospels of Jesus from the Bible, that these were alternative gospels um, that had you know, many sayings of Jesus um, that are entirely different from, the, from what you read in the Bible. It's an entirely different uh, message of Jesus where he preaches that ignorance is the source of our, our suffering and that wisdom is the source of our salvation and that wisdom comes through self-knowledge and that... Um, God is within us. There is a spark of the divine within us all. And so by getting to know ourselves, we can get to know God and we can find God directly through our own personal revelation that does not require any church, it does not require any preacher, no bishops, no priests, no institutions. It was uh, a, a, a personal, a personal experience, which is something that the modern day Protestants revive this tradition in their own way. They, the modern day Protestants believe in personal revelation as well. So this is not outside the scope of, of Christian thought. Uh, the Gnostics uh, saw Paul as the, as the first of their kind, and he had a personal revelation as well. So personal revelation is an important part of the Christian tradition, and, um, and that's what the Gnostics preached, and that's what you're going to see here. But we also talk about the resurrection in the context of, of the pagan mystery traditions and how Jesus may have very well survived the crucifixion, um, because it was uh, a trick, uh, a political stunt, where he and the women pulled off this trick um, by sedating him on the cross and making him appear dead and taking him down and bandaging his wounds before he actually died, such that he, he was, in fact, seen again alive after his public execution, but that it was the women who were responsible for it. They weren't just... Mary Magdalene and the three Marys, they weren't simply witnesses to the resurrection. In this story, in this story, they were completely responsible for the whole thing. So we're going to go through. Um, we've got some art from Juan Hernandez here, um, a.k.a. Akashic Anunnaki. And we'll dig into the art in another episode, but in this one, we're going to focus on the text. So read this short story. 
and imagine an entirely different Christianity rooted in mysticism and wisdom. Jesus and the three Marys faked his death in a political stunt through the power of the feminine divine. The women elevated Jesus from a man into a god. But the male apostles did not approve of revelations from women, and their stories were intentionally forgotten. Three hundred years after Jesus walked the earth, Orthodox Christianity became the state religion of the Roman Empire, and all other spiritual traditions were banned. Temples were shuttered, books were burned, and priests were murdered. All rival religions were branded as blasphemy and exterminated with self-righteous violence. In 367, near Alexandria, Egypt, a Gnostic Christian monk hid a collection of sacred texts in a clay jar buried in a cave. Some of the Gnostic Gospels record the lessons Jesus taught to his earliest followers, and they reveal a mystical Jesus wildly different than the Orthodox Jesus we know today. The Gnostics believed that one's personal revelation of God was more authentic than the teachings of any bishops or priests. The Orthodox branded them as heretical because they challenged the priest's institutional authority, and precious few Gnostic texts escape the purge. Gnostic Mystery Jesus teaches us the divine exists within us all, and the path to the Heavenly Fathers through self-knowledge or gnosis. Ignorance is the source of our suffering, and wisdom our salvation. Jesus taught us to embrace the wisdom of the Divine Mother alongside the Heavenly Father, and the Gnostic Trinity is the Father, Son, and Sophia. Mary Magdalene is the Gnostic Apostle to the Apostles and the keeper of Jesus' closest secrets, like how he died and rose again. The mysteries were ancient, women-led traditions that taught initiates the secrets of immortality and the cycle of life. Hear the mystical teachings of Gnostic Jesus and learn the secrets of his mysterious resurrection. Knowledge of self. Should you, so these are the teachings of Jesus. Knowledge of self. Should you who possess everything not know yourself? If you do not know yourself, you will not know what you, you will not enjoy what you own, but know yourself and have what you enjoy. It's from the Gospel of Philip. Also from the Gospel of Philip, Ignorance. Ignorance is the mother of all evil. Ignorance will eventuate in death, because those who come from ignorance neither were, nor are, nor will be. But those who are in the truth will be perfect when all the truth is revealed. For truth is like ignorance. While hidden, it rests in itself. But when revealed and recognized, it is praised, and that is stronger than ignorance and error. It gives freedom. The Word said, If you know the truth, the truth will make you free. Ignorance is a slave. Knowledge is freedom. If we know the truth, we shall find the fruits of the truth within us. If we join it, it will fulfill us. Jesus and the Feminine Divine Jesus had close friendships with many women, which was countercultural for his era. Jesus knew that the women brought wisdom and they formed his inner circle. Peter and some of the male apostles did not approve and wanted the women gone. Ask your mother. A student once asked the Lord for something from the world, and he said, Ask your mother, and she will give you something from another realm. Gospel of Philip. Three Marys. Three Marys walked with the Lord, his mother, his sister, and Mary of Magdala, his companion. His sister and mother and, and his companion were Mary. Gospel of Philip. Again from the Gospel of Philip. Wisdom, mother of the angels. Wisdom, who's called, who is called barren, is mother of the angels. The companion is Mary of Magdala. Jesus loved her more than his disciples. He kissed her often on her face, more than all of his disciples. And they said, Why do you love her more than us? The Savior answered, saying to them, Why do I not love you like her? Why do I not love you like her? If a blind man and one who sees are together in darkness, they are the same. When light comes, the one who sees will see light. The blind man stays in darkness. Gospel of Philip. It's from the Gospel of Thomas, number 105. Jesus said, Whoever knows the father and the mother will be called the child of a whore. Simon Peter said to them, Mary should leave us. Females are not worthy of the life. Jesus said, Look, I shall guide her to make her male, so she too may become a living spirit, resembling you males. For every female who makes herself male will enter the kingdom of heaven. 
Gospel of Thomas 114. Jesus said, I disclose, I disclose my mysteries to those who are worthy of my mysteries. Do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Gospel of Thomas 62. In these passages, we see very clearly um, the closeness of, of Jesus to Mary Magdalene and that he um, sees in her insights that, that the males do not have and that she, he very clearly says that she is, she is the one who's closest to him. Um, I, I take from these, um, there's a, a few important passages here. When Simon Peter says, now Peter is Peter the Rock, who becomes the first bishop of Rome, the first pope, and the, and the, and the foundation stone of the, of the Christian church. Um, and he is, by Orthodox traditions, Peter is, is closest to Jesus. And these Gnostic traditions, Mary Magdalene is closest, and, the, and that they are rivals. So you can see that in the early days of the church, there were these very, very different opinions about, about what Jesus was saying and what his teachings meant. And as the Orthodoxy took over centuries later, they insisted that their view and that the view of, the, of Peter and of the men was, was going to be the view that was deemed correct and everything else was incorrect. But I find that these passages are, are incredibly insightful um, and, they, and they speak to me. And I find it interesting. Um, first of all, that not only is it, does he have the relationships with women in, in practical terms with you know flesh and blood women, but that also Jesus is very speaks repeatedly about about the mother and the divine mother. Um, he says here, "Whoever knows the father and the mother will be called the child of a whore." This is this is true. This is accurate to the mythology um, of the of the traditions of the day, when the traditions of the mother embrace women's sexuality, because sex is seen as a source of creation, and women are the mothers, and and at at the level of the divine. Uh, the sacred feminine is the mother of all life, and she is not a, a sexually restrained divinity. She is um, sexually active, and they celebrated. And the farther back in time you go, the more they celebrated women's sacred sexuality, and temple prostitution was a, a reality for thousands and thousands of years, including in King Solomon's temple and the pagan Israelites. So the notion that the Divine Mother would be called a whore is actually a totally common trope. Um, Ishtar was the whore of Babylon, and these, um, these, 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 this is a common cultural expression. So the notion that Jesus would say this is fits perfectly within the context of thousands of years of traditions. They do, in fact, call the Divine Mother a sacred whore. Um, long ago, prostitution was celebrated before it became um, for it was condemned under under Christian ethics, and we see in the fall in the, the next passage where Simon Peter says, "Mary should leave us. Females are not worthy of the life." Some translations say females are not worthy of life, and there is no the there, um, not worthy of life at all. And and Jesus says something very interesting. He says, "I shall guide her to make her male, so she too may become a living spirit resembling you males." For every female who makes herself male will enter the kingdom of heaven. Now Jesus is speaking to a group of men here um, and saying, I will make the women like you because this is a very patriarchal environment where men were elevated above women. And so in speaking to men, he says, I will make the women like you, which would probably placates the men. Um, but in other places, such as in the following line from the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus says, I, dis I disclose my mysteries to those who are worthy of my mysteries. Do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. And this is, uh, you know, we're, this is a, a common image of Jesus is that he has secret teachings. Even in the Bible, um, it indicates that Jesus has teachings that he, that he speaks in parables and that only his inner circle get, to, get the revealed messages while most of the people in the public get these uh, sort of ambiguous parables that Jesus likes to teach in. And right here he says, I disclose my mysteries to those who are worthy of my mysteries. Do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. He's stating very clearly that he says different things to different people depending on Jesus's, depending on what Jesus believes that per person is, is capable of understanding. 
And so it's, it's perfectly reasonable to think that he is, you know, placating the men on one hand by saying that we'll make the women more, more like men while having a, a completely different message to the women when, when they're in private. And Jesus was clearly, um, by Gnostic traditions, had the women as, as his inner circle and that they knew things that the men did not know. Jesus taught wisdom from the Gospel of Thomas. His disciples asked him and said to him, do you, want to, how do, do you want us to fast? How should we pray? Should we give to charity? What diet should we observe? And Jesus said, Do not lie, and do not do what you hate. All things are disclosed before heaven. There is nothing hidden that will not be revealed, nothing covered that will remain undisclosed. Let's repeat that. Jesus said, Do not lie, and do not do what you hate. In response to being asked how, you know, how they're to properly behave, he says, Do not lie, and do not do what you hate. All things are disclosed before heaven. There is nothing hidden that will not be revealed, nothing covered that will remain undisclosed. This, this passage speaks to me um, in terms of practical advice that one could take in the modern day of how to live. Do not lie and do not do what you hate. Do not lie and do not do what you hate. This is, this is a way that I've always tried to live, um, try to be as honest as possible within the context of our social lives. And do not do what you hate. Um, make choices that fill your heart, that when you get up in the morning, you want to get up and go about your day and you want to embrace the things you're doing. Um, try not to put yourself in a position where your career or your, or your obligations are of things that undermine your, your heart and soul and what, and what you really need to be doing. If you're in a career where you hate your work, where you're selling yourself out, you should try and get out of it. Um, you know, we're all trapped by circumstances and obligations and finances. It makes things difficult, but try and put yourself in a position where your life is fulfilling and that you're able to pursue a rewarding day-to-day -day life where you can go to bed at night feeling satisfied that you've done something to make yourself better and to make the world a better place. And if you spend your day doing things that you hate doing, such that when you go to bed at night, you have regrets, then your life is on the wrong path. And this message from Jesus is very simple. Do not lie and do not do what you hate. You know, do not lie to yourself. The Gospel of Thomas, the disciples said to Jesus, tell us how our end will be. Jesus said, have you discovered the beginning and now you are seeking the end? Where the beginning is, the end will be. Blessings on you who stand at the beginning. You will know the end and not taste death. Now this is very, this is very close to pagan mystery traditions. This is um, one of the things that really highlights the distinction between monotheistic worldview and, and the pagan worldviews was the notion of linear time versus circular time. And in the Western world, we, we live in linear time. We have a linear calendar. Uh, and we have a linear view of, of the, the expanse of, of world history and, and, and the history of the universe. We track the Big Bang on a linear time model. Um, we, we track the history of the universe on a linear time model all the way back to the Big Bang. Whereas other cultures and other worldviews don't view things that way. The Mayans have, have a circular calendar where, where these long cycles of, of time will reset. You know, we had a, a 25,000 year calendar that reset back in 2012, I believe. And, um, and the, in these circular time notions. And so this is, uh, in the cycles of rebirth and life, death and rebirth, these are very, very oriented towards the mother and towards these pagan notions of, of, of how things reset and recycle. Um, whereas you know, the Christian West, the Orthodoxy teaches uh, the immortality of the soul and a linear path from here, from your physical life into the afterlife of heaven or hell where you remain for eternity and not cycle around in any sort of way. Um, circular thinking is also in, in Eastern traditions and Hinduism and Buddhism are, are deeply rooted in these ideas of, 
of circular life and of rebirth and of, of karmic rebirth. And so you see this very close association here and these Gnostic teachings and Eastern, Eastern mysticism. There's many, many parallels. From the Gospel of Philip, faith and love. Faith receives, love gives. No one receives without faith. No one gives without love. To receive, believe. To love, give. If you give without love, no one derives a thing from what is given. This is another really insightful and profound passage I found uh, to me. Um, I'm still sort of meditating on it to think what it really means, but uh, but it's one that resonates every time. It strikes a chord every time I read it. Faith receives, love gives. No one receives without faith. No one gives without love. To receive, believe. To love, give. If you give without love, no one derives a thing from what is given. If you give without love, no one derives a thing from what is given. I mean, love is to be loving is to be giving. There's no question about that. That that to be loving is to is to give of your spirit and to give of your efforts, to give of your time, to give of your energy, to give of your soul. Um, and one thing that both mystics teach and you learn as a, as a parent that giving is more rewarding than receiving that when the sacrifice a parent makes and i think any I mean, most parents will tell you this that people debate whether you know, should you not have children so that you can, you know, live your own life and, and do all the fun stuff you want to do, um, you know, because you can spend money and have time, time and money to go on vacations and indulge your, your passions. Whereas if you've got children, all of your time and money and effort go to the children and you don't get to indulge your own personal pattern, passions as much. I, I found that the choice of being a parent was totally worthwhile and that I got a lot more out of what I gave than what I would have received otherwise. Um, and mystics teach the same thing, that some of the happiest people in the world you'll ever meet are live, renounce all material possessions and live a life of charity um, in, in, in the ghettos and yet they're smiling from ear to ear they live life with like a you know with this grin across their face meanwhile the some of the wealthiest people who live in luxury who are constantly acquiring more goods and more stuff and more experiences you know they can be so miserable um, they've got everything materially and yet they've got nothing spiritually and they're very unhappy people and so this is one of the paradoxes of life that you know all these material possessions aren't don't translate necessarily to uh, a spiritually fulfilling life they're, they're two completely distinct pathways um, and faith and love um, something worth, worth thinking about Jesus said seek and you will find in the past I did not tell you the things about which you asked me now I'm willing to tell you but you do not seek them Gospel of Thomas 92. This is a good one. This is from the Gospel of Philip. Mystery. It is good to speak of mystery because the Father of all joined with the Virgin who came down and on that day a fire shone over him. He came to the bridal chamber so on that very day his body came into being and on that day he left the chamber with the splendor of what had passed between the bride and the bridegroom. Through this force Jesus did everything. It is good for each of his disciples to go into the chamber and rest. Gospel of Philip. So here we have one of the passages that speaks to the mother and the father together. And, and to mystery. Um, it is good to speak of mystery. It is... One of my core philosophical beliefs is that the human experience, that we live in a fundamentally mysterious world. That... 
the reality that whatever the cosmic metaphysical truth that exists out there is so far beyond our human comprehension, so far beyond our five senses, so far beyond the capacity for our flesh brain computer um, to process the information that our, our senses don't pick up all the signals that are available and we don't have the signal processing to deal with them even if we could collect them and so we live in a fairly a, a socially constructed reality that is somewhat um, ambiguous and somewhat uh, and, and it's extremely malleable and it's and the reality we live in is is a social construct um, that we, we we accept certain things as being objective simply because other people confirm that so-called objectivity but really we don't know is the sky really blue the only reason we know the sky is blue because other people tell us the sky is blue and other people confirm for us what we see and as long as all the other people agree with what we see we call that objective but really we don't know we don't know how uh, other other biological entities would see the sky um, so we live in a very mysterious world and it is good to speak of mystery so back to this this poem it is good to speak of mystery because the father of all joined with the virgin who came down and on that day a fire shone over him he came to the bridal chamber so on that very day his body came into being and on that day he left the chamber with the splendor of what had passed between the bride and bridegroom through his force jesus did everything it is good for each of his disciples to go into the chamber and rest now this speaks to a number of things about the mother and the father um the father of all joined with the virgin who came down so he's calling the mother is, is here called the virgin she's both called the virgin and a whore both um both this is one of the many paradoxes of life is that the divine mother is both a virgin and a whore um and she's especially a virgin because she was the uh in the pagan traditions the primordial first mover of creation was a mother a mother who gives birth to her mate who is god and that the mother of god the mother is the mother of god as well as his mate she gave birth to her own mate because she was all alone that's why she was the virgin and so the father of all joined with the virgin and on that day a fire shone over him he came to the bridal chamber and on that day he left the chamber with the splendor of what had passed between the bride and bridegroom so the father mates with the mother and from there he gains his splendor he gets his capacity to bring the universe to order from the mother and through this force jesus did everything and it's good for the disciples to go into the chamber and rest i take that to mean that that last line that for the uh the followers uh the spiritual seekers i take this as an instruction to go you know to a temple or or or, or a sacred space to, to meditate and pray on the father and the mother that's how i take that last line um but it just this overall poem speaks to this duality of life and and of the mother and the father and it is a direct it's taken directly from you know long-standing existing um pagan uh spiritual motifs uh, that have been around for thousands of years this is uh this is comes from a long legacy and tradition this is uh an old type of uh, modality here so creation in Gnostic mythology, Yahweh is the demiurge, the flawed creator of this flawed reality. And Yahweh is but one of the many sons of El Elyon, God Most High, the Monad, the true Heavenly Father. So I want to, I want to elaborate on this a little bit. The Gnostics have some pretty um, detailed and elaborate mythology about, um, about the nature of the... Uh, the divine council, if you will, the you know the, the angels and the demons and all of the the, uh, the spiritual creatures, but they make very clear that the God of the Old Testament, Yahweh, the Jewish God, is not the same as the Heavenly Father. That they are different, distinct characters, and this is what I discovered. Um, this this tracks with what I how I read the Old Testament, which is that you can see very clearly that the Israelites were pagans. 
before they became monotheists, and they had an entire pantheon of gods. So El and Asherah are the, you know, the heavenly father and the earthly mother, and they are the parents of all the other gods. Yahweh was just one of the many sons of El, and this is referenced multiple times in Scripture that um, Yahweh is one of the sons of El. And so Yahweh defeats Baal to become king of the gods, and this is all happening during the um, during the historical period when the nations of Israel and Judah actually existed historically in the first temple period. Um, so from the year 1000 when King David took Jerusalem to uh, I think it's 586, somewhere around there when, when the Babylonians destroyed the temple. So the, you know, the first temple survived for about 400, 400 and some years. And, um, the, uh, and it was pagan. They were pagans, and Yahweh was one of these pagan gods, and he was a reformer, um, trying to change old traditions, get rid of the old mother goddesses, and all this stuff that I talk about in my book. But the the main takeaway, the key takeaway of all this, is just that El and Yahweh are two separate gods, and you can see this in the Bible, because we have two names of God in the Bible. Um, in the Hebrew, it's Yahweh and Elohim, or El Elyon, uh, but in English, you see it as Yahweh is written as the Lord, and Lord is always in all caps in English Bible, and then and then Elohim, or El, is written as God. And so when you see in an English text in the Old Testament where it goes back and forth between God and the Lord, God and the Lord, it's because um, you know they're using these two different names, Elohim or Yahweh, and that is because originally, originally they were two entirely separate gods. They were two separate gods, and El is. Uh, you know, the ancient sky father who is across many cultures and all the other gods are his children along with the divine mother. Um, they are the parents of all the gods. And so El Elyon was distant and removed from human affairs and it's his children who are the ones who are active in the affairs of people. So to get to the true heavenly father, you have to bypass his son who's the king of the gods and get all the way to the Father. And this is what Jesus is teaching in the Gnostics, is they need to bypass Yahweh, who they don't like. The Gnostics are not fond of Yahweh, because as many people, modern commentators point out, the God of the Old Testament is a pretty nasty character. He's jealous and genocidal, um, and he's not entirely very loving. And in fact, all the, the texts where they talk about a loving God, those are all Elohim. That's all El. El is actually, by tradition, a, a kind and loving God, whereas Yahweh is this uh, fairly abusive character who is uh, you know, quite misogynistic against the women. And so in the Gnostics, they, uh, they describe Yahweh as the demiurge, the flawed creator of this flawed reality, which actually makes a lot of sense um, that we do live in Yahweh's world. Here in the West, if you're a Christian or a Muslim or a Jew, uh, the world you inhabit, the worldview you inhabit is, is Yahweh's world. Um, we live in Yahweh's world, but um, other cultures and other time periods, they had they had different gods, and uh, it wasn't Yahweh's world, and it doesn't have to be Yahweh's world forever. But the original Heavenly Father, he's he transcends all traditions. He is uh, a human archetype of an archetype of the human mind that, um, as far as I can tell, goes back back to the cognitive leap. I, I, my I'm, my position is that. The mother and the father as, as archetypes, the divine mother and divine father as archetypes go all the way back to the cognitive leap and that these are um, the warp and weft threads upon which we weave the fabric of our reality. Um, and that as you uh, elaborate on the nature of God and give him a name and give him stories and give him a character, then you get into the space of culture and religion. But when you strip it all the way back to just the deist core, yeah, you know, now it's now it's a, a an archetype, and the same thing for the mother. It says she's the mother of all life. The father puts the universe in order, and the mother is the mother of all life. And together they they represent the whole of the human experience. And so the Gnostics are very clear in wanting to connect to the mother. They're very clear that they want to bypass Yahweh. That they think Yahweh's creation is flawed. Um, and that then that the path to the divine, the path to the true father is through self-knowledge, because that's the closest you can get to God is finding that spark of the divine within yourself. 
Creation. From the Gospel of Philip. Creation. The world came into being through error. The agent who made it wanted it to be imperishable and immortal. He failed. He came up with less than his desire. The world was never incorruptible, nor was its maker. Things are not imperishable, but children are. Nothing can endure that is not first a child. Whoever cannot receive, surely, will be unable to give. Again, from the Gospel of Philip. Um, the agent who made this world failed. He came up with less than his desire. The world was never incorruptible, nor was its maker. And so this is a, uh, you know, again, speaking to Yahweh as this flawed, flawed God. This is from the Sophia of Jesus. Um, Sophia being wisdom, of course, and the mother. The perfect Savior said to them, I want you to know that Sophia, the mother of the universe and the consort, desired by herself to bring these to existence without her male consort, but by the will of the Father of the universe that his unimaginable goodness might be revealed, he created the curtain between the immortals and those who came afterward and the consequences that might follow. Now, the Sophia of Jesus is actually, this is one short clip from a, a very extensive book um, that has a very elaborate mythology and a lot of different names uh, are introduced for these same, these same archetypal characters, but it gets a little confusing for the reader, so I didn't, I didn't put too much of it in here. Just this one clip. But the Sophia of Jesus is a, one of the longer of the Gnostic Gospels, and it uh, has a pretty elaborate mythology that some people find very, very interesting. The Psychedelic Eucharist. Now, it's been suggested for a few years now um, of the possibility that that Jesus, that the Eucharist that Jesus introduced, is a uh, possibly a psychedelic ceremony, which would track with the mystery traditions because we know the mystery religions were doing these kinds of things at that time, and were very popular. So the mystery religions in, the, in these days we're talking about the Eleusinian mysteries of, of Greece with Demeter and Persephone, of which uh, the Dionysus, um, the god of wine and, and ecstasy, was was also closely associated. He's another one of these dying and rising gods. And his ceremonies were wrapped up with these mystery traditions of the goddesses. And so we know that many, uh, that Dionysus was a big influence on Christian thought because, um, well, first of all, he was just one of the most popular gods at the, in the era. But there are specific stories, the story of, of Jesus turning water into wine at, at a wedding is lifted explicitly from a, a Dionysus story. That, that's the exact story. Dionysus goes to a wedding and turns the water into wine and... and, and you know, when the wine had run out. Um, and so that story of Dionysus gets gets revamped and turned into a Jesus story. Um, and so we know that, that, that the Christians were definitely influenced by by these pagan traditions that were in the same town that they're living in. They're culturally exposed to them. Um, these were, you know, the, the biggest festivals and traditions of, of the ancient Near East. And so, and these drugs were around. Cannabis was around, psychedelics were around, mushrooms, ergot. Um, so, and the other thing about the Eucharist is that, um, it's not a Jewish tradition. The, the, everybody acknowledges that Jesus was a Jew and that Christian has his Jewish roots. Nonetheless, the Eucharist ceremony itself is not Jewish. And where Jesus says, you know, this eat of my flesh and drink of my blood and you will become like me. And so we eat these wafers and drink the wine. Um, no, no, no Jewish that is not Jewish. Like Jewish people would not talk like that. They don't think like that. That sort of this sort of pseudo cannibalism and blood magic is is not a Jewish. That just does not come from Jewish. Um, does not come from Jewish traditions or a Jewish legacy. It, it comes from someplace else. So presumably it comes from you know the pagan world because that's that's the alternative. That's what was there. Um, and so the idea that the Eucharist may have actually been originally a psychedelic ceremony um, that allows people to not taste to, to taste because in the, mis in the mysteries what they would do is with the psychedelic experience one of the things it does is it's ego death and it will it will uh, kind of eviscerate your ego for for a time and um which can be an incredibly illuminating experience and incredibly like um challenging experience but in the, in the mystery in the context of the mystery religions what it allowed people to do was experience death before death the people were prepared themselves for their eventual mortality by going through these training and these ceremonies, 
that allow them to experience uh, uh, you know, a taste of death, a sampling of death, an inoculation against death, if you will, um, through the use of, of elaborate ceremonies and, and some aspect of psychedelics. I don't want to overstate it that it's all a drug experience. I don't think it is. But I think the drugs are, are a component of it. And that in the context of a rit- ritualistic ceremony uh, with many steps leading up to it, you know, in, in the, they talk about set and setting having an important role on the drug experience. Um, and what kind of intentions you have for the experience will have a huge impact on what kind of experience you have. So whether it's an ayahuasca ceremony um, or, or any other kind of, of ritualistic use of, of, of entheogenic plant drugs, the intention you put into it is, is incredibly important. And it's, these aren't just for recreation. You know, these are for deep spiritual insight. And so there's a, um, there's a lot of parallels, a lot of parallels for the Gnostics or for the Eucharist and, 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 these, and the possibility of these psychedelic mystery traditions. And especially when you read some of these, um, well, I've got some quotes here from the Bible as well as from the Gnostics. So we'll just read it here. Um, psychedelic Eucharist. Psychedelic plant drugs were used in the mysteries to help the initiate find immortality by tasting death before death through the dissolution of the ego. The Divine Mother speaks to us through the plants and teaches us to embrace the cycle of life. In the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus said, Whoever drinks from my mouth will become like me. I myself shall become that person, and the hidden things will be revealed to that one. From the Bible, from the book of John, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. John 6:51. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. John 6, 54-56 And Jesus said, Whoever discovers what these sayings mean will not taste death. That's from the Gospel of Thomas. Um, So there's these these parallels between the, the two Gospel of Thomas passages where Jesus says, you know, the person will not taste death. Um, they will become like him. And then, and then from the biblical book of John, um, you know, whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will now give for the life of the world. Um, this is... Uh, you know, I'm not, I don't want to say too much more... I, there's there's just this tantalizing possibility. There's books have been written. Um, Brian Morescu had a recent book called The Immortality Key that goes into the possibilities of the psychedelic Eucharist. And um, other, there's other books out there as well. I, I think it's an interesting thought experiment. And one thing about the last comment on the psychedelics is that they're really transforming the Western world. Um, they are a, a catalyst for a real mental transformation and we've been seeing this ever since the 1960s when the psychedelics really became a thing um, that they were you know rediscovered in the West and it if you've never taken them they will radically shift your worldview Um, it's it I, I took them first when I was pretty young and what I found was that it 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 was it was incredibly profound the first thing I noticed was that I had a, a sort of a gestalt between seeing matter and energy, if you will. Everything that had been once been fixed objects, I realized were all in motion and in moving, and that everything was a flow of energy. That everything in in the world, this desk, a table, a, a, a building, a mountaintop, a mountain, they're all in motion. They're vibrating. They're decaying. They're hurtling through space and time. Everything's moving. Nothing is fixed. That was the first thing I noticed. Um, and then from later on, I learned from the teachings of Terence McKenna about Gaia consciousness and that the idea that um, the earth is alive and one big living green creature and that she speaks to us through the plants. And this is the idea of the Divine Mother as the mother of all life. And this is you know, kind of an indigenous teaching to see the, the earth as a, as a living creature. 
and this is something I've come around to, um, and 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 this is you know psychedelics do, you know facilitate this kind of transformation, this mental transformation. They've had, and they have a a, a really profound role on the on the broader culture because, you know, Christianity hates psychedelics. Christianity has hated psychedelics all along, um, precisely because it's part of these rival religious traditions. Um, precisely because it undermines the authority of the Orthodox Church and the Orthodox preachers. Um, and so they've always hated the psychedelics. They always hated the plant drugs for centuries and centuries. And they, you know, they persecuted Native Americans for taking them. So this, this contrast, and in, and, in, and in turn, when psychedelics came back in, in the West, they shifted our entire culture. They had a huge impact on music, on, on popular music. They had a huge role on the invention of the internet and on, on computer programmers and many of our most important um, innovators in the, in, the, in the internet space, going back to the 1970s, um, were heavily influenced by their use of LSD and, and mushrooms. Uh, Steve Jobs was on the record talking about this when he started up Apple computers and, and many others. So that the, the profound impact that, that psychedelics are having and enforcing the West to uh, re-examine fundamental worldviews cannot be underestimated. It is a they, they they shake the foundation of our entire concept of reality, and as a culture, we have to. You know, the genie's out of the bottle, so we can't put them back in. People are taking them all over the place. They realize mushrooms grow all over the place. They're easy to grow if you want to grow them yourself, um, and so the genie's out of the bottle, and the West is going to have to contend with what these psychedelics are teaching us because it, it, is, it is deeply deeply profound and if it turns out to be true that Jesus was using them then all the more reason that we need a religious revival and religious reformation that takes into account this aspect of the human experience because right now in the Christian West psychedelics are not accounted for they're they're deemed heretical blasphemous and they're persecuted um, and it is not they're not deemed as a, a, a source of quality information um, but I disagree I think they are so that's all I'm going to say about psychedelics right now we're going to get to the heart of the story Jesus embraced death Jesus was a political and religious revolutionary, among many other things. He challenged the Sanhedrin, the Jewish authorities at the temple in Jerusalem. Jesus said the Sanhedrin were corrupt and he planned to overthrow them. He intentionally made them angry by kicking the money changers out of the temple and mocking their leadership. Now this, of course, comes from the Gospels, comes from the Bible, that Jesus um, you know, goes to the Jerusalem temple and overthrows the money changers, and this uh, leads to him being arrested and executed. Jesus knew his actions would get him arrested and executed, but he did not flee or attempt to escape. Jesus predicted his death many times and said that he would rise again because he had a plan to survive. Jesus did not inform his 12 male disciples who fled in horror when their teacher was handed over to the Roman authorities to be crucified. So if you remember from the Bible, um, Jesus knows he's going to get arrested. He waits in the Garden of Gethsemane. On the Thursday night, the night he gets arrested, he could have fled into the night. They could have fled into the darkness and ran, but he did not do so. Jesus waited to be arrested. Um, you know, the story says that he was agonizing, that he, you know, he sweated blood um, in anticipation. But nonetheless, he could have run away, but he didn't. He waited to be arrested. This is from the Bible. Mark chapter 9. Um, Jesus was teaching his disciples. He said to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. That's Mark 9, 31 and 32. Now, that, that is just one of many, many verses in the canonical Gospels where Jesus is predicting his death and resurrection after three days. There was at least, there's probably a dozen passages. <clears throat> now, this is from the Gospel of Thomas, from the Gnostic Gospel. Jesus said, The Pharisees and the scholars have taken the keys of knowledge and have, and have hidden them. They have not entered, nor have they allowed those who want to enter to go inside. You should be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Gospel of Thomas, and again from the Gospel of Thomas. Jesus said, Shame on the Pharisees. They are like a dog sleeping in the cattle manger. It does not eat or let the cattle eat. Now these passages sort of show Jesus' disdain for 
uh, the Jewish leadership of the time. Uh, this is back from the Bible. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they slapped him in the face. Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers mocked him and beat him. This is, um, you know, this is the, the passion part of, of the Jesus story where he is arrested um, and beaten and whipped before being executed. Now, in traditional teachings... Christians say that Jesus was was completely brutalized at this point in the story, that he is, um, in your traditional passion plays, when they depict this, um, Jesus is beaten within in an, within an inch of his life, within a millimeter of his life. He is, he's, you know, viciously flogged and whipped, and his the flesh is torn off his back down to the bone. He's beaten senseless. He's dripping in blood. Um, he can barely walk. He can barely carry his cross up the hill. But, you know, those are all elaborations. The, the text, the gospel texts themselves are not actually detailed at all about the nature of Jesus' wounds. They say he got flogged. They say he got beaten, beaten up. And then he gets crucified with, with you know, nails to his hands and wrists. And then later on gets stabbed um, afterwards, you know, with a spear in his side. Um The, uh, um, you know, the Gospels are not detailed at, at all about the nature of, of, his, of his wounds, and they're actually quite circumspect. They don't really detail anything. Um, and if you just take a detailed look at the text, there's no, there's, there's no indication that he was, how, how badly he was beaten. It just says he was whipped. Um, we don't know if he was whipped once, whipped 10 times, whipped 100 times. You know, what kind of whip they use, it doesn't say, and none of those details are there. And people like to make claims like, oh, Romans always, always, always did it this way, or they always did it that way. And we know they used a cat of nine tails with these metal hooks on the end, and that's the way they always did it. The Gospels don't say anything of the sort. We don't know what, how, what his injuries were. There's no evidence of any of it. Mysteries. The critical moment has arrived. Jesus has been arrested. He is beaten, flogged, and stabbed, stabbed by the Romans. His wounds are serious, but not fatal. On Golgotha, Jesus is nailed through his wrists and feet onto a heavy wooden cross and lifted up to suffer a slow, agonizing death. The three Marys were close at hand. When he was ready, Mary Magdalene soaked a sponge in, the, in her mystery potion, a sacred tincture that would make Jesus swoon and appear dead. The strong drink was made from cannabis, the sacred plant of the Divine Mother, Eve's tree of knowledge, and Moses' burning bush. Jesus swallowed the bitter drink and promptly collapsed. Like the Israelite mothers centuries earlier who ritually wept for Tammuz, so that Astarte, the Queen of Heaven, would restore him to life and majesty, the three Marys ushered Jesus into the underworld and then brought him back. By the powers of the feminine divine, the three Marys elevated Jesus from a man into a god. Jesus' body was taken down from the cross after a few short hours when crucifixions normally took days. The three Marys had help from Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, who had an empty tomb nearby and plenty of medicines and bandages. They treated Jesus' wounds and laid him to rest undisturbed under heavy sedation for a day and a half, a perfect prescription for nursing a badly wounded man. At dawn after the Sabbath, the three Marys went back to the tomb with more medicines and revived Jesus. The women ran and told the men that Jesus was alive, all the while keeping the secret behind the miracle. So now this is just my take on the resurrection story. Um, I've written an entire article on the swoon theory and how cannabis could have been used um, to create a sedative. Uh, a very potent tincture of cannabis could have been realistically used to create a sedative that would make Jesus look appear dead. We have a, can have a whole scientific discussion on this. It would be a separate, separate conversation. But it's, it's a theory we can test and, and for which we have historical legacy for why, for why it could have been. So um, what I'm presenting here is, is a reimagining of this scenario where it's treated like a, a, a pagan mystery tradition. I, I argue also that cannabis was deeply sacred um, in the pagan traditions, and it's in the Bible, that it's, that it's um, all over the Moses story, that it's the burning bush, and, the, and it's the holy anointing oil, and it's all over the Moses part of the story. And I also argue that 
cannabis is the tree of knowledge in the Garden of Eden, that it's symbolic of, um, of these goddess traditions, and that um, like along with the serpent, which is also another potent symbol of the goddess traditions, that you know these symbols in the Garden of Eden are being condemned um, because it's a, that story is a condemnation of of these of exactly these pagan traditions. So that's where the the, the cannabis being there for Eve and for Moses comes from. I have a, you know, it's all in my book. But and um, so so you know when they give Jesus the wine vinegar, um, it's a sedative, arguably. And so then, and then I say, the, like their Israelite mothers centuries earlier, who ritually wept for Tammuz so that Astarte, the queen of heaven, would restore him to life and majesty, the three Marys ushered Jesus into the underworld and then brought him back. So the women weeping for Tammuz is referenced in, in Ezekiel, in the prophet Ezekiel in the Bible, in the Old Testament. Um, he talks about this, is a, it's from a vision that Ezekiel has of, of various abominations that he disapproves of. And, you know, women weeping for Tammuz at the Jerusalem temple was one of these horrible visions that he imagined. Uh, but what he's referencing is that, that this is one of these dying and rising God traditions. Part of the ceremony is that when the God would die, the women would ritually weep. They, these are multi, multiple day long festivals. And on one of the days uh, was the day of ritual weeping. And the women would cry and weep and mourn and lament. And... And then the following day or, or days later, um, you know, that's when the God is dead and the God is in the underworld. And then days later, when the God is restored, it's time for a big celebration. And so these ritual weeping and ritual lamentations was an important part of the ceremony. And so um, Tammuz is, is, the, is the, the, the Israelite Canaanite version of 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 one of these gods. Tammuz, uh, he goes with Ishtar and with Astart. And we know it's Israelite because it's one of the, the months of the Israelite calendar is Tammuz. So we know that this is a Jewish or uh, Israelite tradition. And Astart is, is the queen of heaven in the Old Testament that, that King Solomon worshiped. So the women would weep for Tammuz so that Astart could restore him to life. And, um, and that's what I'm saying is happening here. The, the women weeping for Jesus, and then they're going to bring him back. And then, you know, Joseph of Arathea and Nicodemus are, are, are helping. All right, we'll get into that in a second. Here. Um, so here's a nice uh, one of Juan's arts. And we got the serpent and cannabis and the mother and Mary Magdalene. Some more quotes here. This is from the, these are from the Bible. Um, by pouring this ointment on my body, she has prepared me for burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever this good news is proclaimed for the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. Matthew 26, 12 and 13. Many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Matthew 27, 55. Standing by the cross were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. John 19, 25. So we're just, we're, this is just the... the the, the Bible version of the crucifixion story. And here's the, the this is the, uh, the critical moment. This is from the book of John. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on the stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up the spirit. Now this moment where Jesus is given this wine vinegar immediately before he expires is repeated in three of the three of the four gospels. So it's an important detail. Um, they would not have the gospel writers have, would not have included that detail if uh, if it wasn't important. And it certainly doesn't seem spurious. And it, it, it seems critical. And I think that people probably for centuries have been making this argument that you know Jesus was sedated. Um, I learned this story from Chris Bennett, the cannabis. Uh, cannabis scholar, and he learned it from Hugh Schoenfeld, who wrote a book called The Passover Plot back in the 1960s. And I'm sure Schoenfeld heard that from somebody else, that I, I have no doubt that the idea that Jesus was sedated and survived the crucifixion is a, is a very, very old, old, old notion. So these are a couple of my favorite uh, images that Juan's done. This is you know, Jesus on the cross with the third eye and the angels on his wings. 
and he's he's uh, in in Juan's words, this is uh, Jesus is, is hallucinating at the moment that he crosses over. He's taking the potion, and he's at that final moment before he expires. Um, and he's this is the moment when he says, "Why, oh God, have you have you forsaken me?" Um, this is at that, that moment of a pure insight and revelation while he's on the cross. And then this one, next one is actually uh, arguably my favorite of Juan's pictures, at least the ones for the Jesus, my favorite of Juan's Jesus pictures. And here is again also on the cross, surrounded by the mother and the women. And if you'll notice, the whole image is a big uterus. Um, and it's Jesus being you know encircled by the feminine divine. And that it's the powers of the mother that are going to elevate him from a man into a god. When the, sort, when, when the centurions came to Jesus, they did not break his legs since they saw he was already dead. John 19.33 Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent men, member of the Sanhedrin, who was himself looking forward to the kingdom of God, came and boldly went into Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked whether, whether he had already died. When he found out from the centurion, he gave the corpse to Joseph. Mark 15, 43 to 45. This is, this is important. This is when they're taking the body down from the cross. Crucifixions normally take days. This is a critical detail. Crucifixions normally take days. Um, slow and agonizing deaths. And so Jesus, by the, by the gospel accounts, is only on the cross for a couple of hours. And they were surprised that he died so quickly. And they're saying right here that Pontius Pilate, the, the Roman governor, is explicitly surprised. Um, but he says, okay, if the soldiers say he's dead, then you can have the body. But he was being, there was a trick. He only appeared dead. Nicodemus, who had previously come to him at night, also came, bringing a mixture of about 75 pounds of myrrh and aloes. Then they took Jesus' body and wrapped it in linen cloths with the aromatic spices, according to the burial customs of the Jews. John 19, 39 and 40. So again, from the Bible. Um, this is where they, they're bringing Nicodemus is one of the one of the um, one of the allies, one of the conspirators, if you will. And he's bringing Joseph of Arimathea had the tomb, and Nicodemus is bringing the medicines and the linens. And seventy five pounds of myrrh and aloes is a. Uh, um, it could be a, you know it's first of all it's a lot, um, and secondly it, it it definitely could be a euphemism for just medicines in general. Uh, myrrh has medicinal qualities. Aloe is certainly medicinal. Um, so to me, you know, when you combine that with the clean linens, to me, it reads that they're, they're bandaging his wounds, that they're patching them up and then laying, laying them to lie down. Um, again, under heavy sedation. So, I mean, what more would you want? If you're badly wounded, what more would you want than to be, have your wounds bandaged, to be heavily sedated and laid to rest for a day and a half? Uh, while you just can rest undisturbed. I mean, it's a perfect recipe for healing a wounded man. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so they might go anoint Jesus' body. Mark 16, 1. After the Sabbath sat dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. Matthew 28, 1. Now, so these are the passages from Sunday morning. So Jesus is, is killed on Friday. He's buried Friday night. Um, Saturday is a Sabbath, so no one can do anything. And then at, dawn, at daybreak, at dawn on Sunday morning, after the Sabbath is over, uh, Mary Magdalene and the other women are immediately back to the tomb with more medicines um, to go, they say, anoint the body. But um, really what they're doing is, is they're reviving them. There's the women in the tomb. When Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. Mark 16, 9. So he appears first to Mary Magdalene. Now the reference to the seven demons, I believe could be a reference to the mystery traditions. Uh, that is, you know, the seven gates um, and seven steps and, and the mo motifs of, of the number seven repeat over and over again in the mystery traditions. When Ishtar goes to, descends to the underworld in the, in the earliest of these stories, she has to go through seven gates and remove seven pieces of clothing and jewelry until she ends up naked at the end. Um, so the seven demons, now, now I'm speculating here, but I, but I do believe that could be a reference to the mystery traditions. Now, Mary Magdalene is also commonly called a prostitute, 
which is also would be totally, now that might just be a slur made up by church fathers later on, but it also might be an informed, um, an informed opinion that actually she did come out of these pagan traditions or at least had exposed herself to them or perhaps she was a, perhaps she was a bad girl who, who left her Jewish heritage to go dabble in these, you know, pagan traditions across town. Um, and then, you know, she found her way to Jesus. Who knows? I'm purely speculating here. Um, but these pagan mystery traditions were all around. They were in the same communities that the Jews were living in. This is all at the Hellenistic time period. So these traditions were, were available. They were things that the women could, could have gotten themselves involved in. Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. She saw the stone had been removed from the tomb. She turned around and saw Jesus standing there. John 20, 1 and 14. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. Now the identity of the three Marys is not always clear. We know it's Mary Magdalene and that, and that it's Mother Mary. But we, the third Mary is, is never uh, thoroughly, the different accounts give different names for who the third Mary is. Um, so, but the three Marys is kind of a shorthand and that's a, a Catholic tradition. So there's legacy there to just to say, to use the term three Marys. Dying and rising. Jesus was seen alive after his public execution by a number of people. The first generation of witnesses convinced many people that they had witnessed a miracle an unexplained good fortune. Jesus conquered death just like he said he would. This is critical. The atheists and, and the Jesus mythicists will tell you that either Jesus didn't exist or that he was probably was just killed just like anybody else. And then his followers were so bereaved that they invented stories or just had bereavement syndrome where they imagined seeing their loved one. Now, this is no, these are very common. You know, it's not unusual for people to be so upset after they're in their mourning the death of a loved one that they that they claim to see them again. You know, and in their mind, maybe they do see them again. Uh, these are certainly not unusual. It would not have been unusual back then. It's not unusual today. So that those kind of critiques are are easy enough to make, and if people have been making them for a long time. Nonetheless, the story we have, and the entire premise, the entire foundation of the entire Christian religion, is that this guy was seen alive again, and that in the Gospels it says. Nobody believes us. We saw something amazing and nobody believes us. I actually just don't find it that hard to believe. Um, I actually don't, in the context of the idea that he, that it was a stunt and that he could have survived the crucifixion, I just don't find it hard to believe. I think that the straight reading of the text defends a swoon theory interpretation and that then you can give credibility to the first generation of witnesses. You can say that, yes, they in fact did see this guy alive. And then the stories after that get elaborated on. The stories after that get become mythologized, but that the heart of the story, the kernel of the story, is that this guy was publicly executed and survived and was seen alive after his public execution. Um, I don't find that hard to believe. I just, in, in a world that where crazy things happen all the time, where bizarre, unusual things happen all the time, I just don't think this ranks that high on the list of things that are hard to believe. Um, just the straight reading of the text, to me, says that swoon theory is, is, is by far the, the best explanation that gives credence to Christian claims and still sticks to common sense and science and rationality and reason and naturalistic explanations. Um, so for me, uh, I, I believe swoon theory. I do believe there was a real Jesus, and I believe he was he was seen after he was publicly executed. Can I prove it? No. Um, and I'm not even attempting to prove it. Um, you know, people can believe what they want to believe. And this is, uh, this is how I read it. This is how I interpret the text. So back to the Bible. Jesus was buried. He was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And, I, and that... Inside. Jesus was buried. He was raised on the third day according to the scriptures and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brothers at once, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. 
Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 4 to 7. That's, that's the Apostle Paul giving his version. Um, Acts 1 to 3. Um, after his suffering, Jesus presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. And from the book of Matthew, Jesus rebuked them for the lack of faith and stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. So again, um, after his suffering, Jesus presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. You know, they saw him alive. It doesn't say that they saw him wounded or unwounded. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. So what, the way I interpret this is that Jesus would have been badly wounded and that he lived for basically a month. He lived for 40 days and then he dies for real because then they say, then he ascends to heaven. Uh, so to me, the way, I, again, just keeping a, a simple, straight reading of the text, I, I think that he survives the execution, but he doesn't live for long. He lives for another month, 40 days, and then he dies for real and is quietly buried. That, that's my take on it. But he did live long enough to be seen and he did long, live long enough that credible witnesses were able to convince people that, that they'd seen him alive. And, it, and they weren't. And the fact that they had credibility is key. It wasn't just that some you know crazy religious fanatics were out there moaning about their you know mourning their lost teacher. Is that these people actually you know and you know and who were not convincing to the rest of the people in town. Um, you know these witnesses for whatever reason were convincing. Now this next one is one of my favorites. This comes from the Gospel of Philip. Jesus tricked everyone. Jesus tricked everyone. Excuse me. Jesus tricked everyone. He did not appear as he was, but in a way not to be seen. Yet he appeared to all of them. To the great he appeared as great, to the small as small, to the angels he appeared as an angel, and to humans as a human. And he hid his word from everyone. Some looked at him and thought they saw themselves. When before his disciples he appeared gloriously on the mountain, he was not small. No, he became great, and he made his disciples grow so they would know his immensity. Jesus tricked everyone. He did not appear as he was, but in a way not to be seen. This is, um, you know, in the context of swoon theory, this is, I absolutely adore this, this, this poem from Gospel of Philip. Um, you know, and it speaks to, again. It speaks to the idea that he had, um, um, you know, different teachings for for the, the inner circle than for everybody else, um, and that he had secret knowledge that only only his wisest adepts could that that he would teach it to, um, and so that then he tricked people in the public, even even his own disciples. Um, so yeah, I think that this 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 poem, and when I found that in the Gospel of Philip, I I, I, I just laughed out loud. I said, "Of course, of course he did." Jesus tricked everyone. He did not appear as he was, but in a way not to be seen. Yet he appeared to all of them. To the great he appeared as great. To the small as small. To angels he appeared as an angel, and to humans as a human. And he hid his word from everyone. I love it. So the first Christians, Jesus did not live for long. And after he passed on, factions arose within the community immediately. Mary Magdalene was seen to be the apostle of the apostles, and she was sought out for her visions and insight. But the apostle Peter resented her leadership. In time, the Orthodox Church removed women from leadership and consolidated their male only authority that rejects all notions of a divine mother or personal revelations of God. For the Orthodox Church, its institutional authority would always be the primary concern over truth and salvation. The Gnostics were lost to history, but many of their ideas live on today. In fact, for modern-day Protestants, especially you know more liberal, um, unorthodox Protestants, who the, the New Agey types who talk about Christ consciousness, um, this is dovetails perfectly with these old Gnostic teachings. The idea that you know you don't need the the Bible really even. And that you get to know Jesus through yourself and through Christ consciousness and through an elevated spirituality. Um, this, these modern day Protestant notions and these old Gnostic notions are, are, are the same. They're the same. It's the same thing. 
except that the Protestants don't talk about a divine mother or anything, but the idea of that, that, that um, you get yourself in touch with your Christ consciousness and that you can become Jesus, find Jesus within yourself, these are very powerful teachings that are very, very popular among many people. And, um, and here we see them from, from the fourth century and from older. Uh, these go back to the earliest days of Christianity. And then when the Orthodox Church took over, they insisted their institutional authority was more important. And they didn't want people having personal insights. They wanted people to come to the church to get there, um, you know, to get teachings from them, that, they, that the church would mediate your experience of the divine and, um, and you wouldn't do it yourself. Um, this is from this last passage. This is the last passage here. And this is from the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. Now, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene is, is quite fragmented. We only have um, short passages from it, but the passages we have are incredibly insightful. Peter said to Mary, Sister, we know that the Savior loved you more than the rest of the women. Tell us the words of the Savior, which you remember, which you know, but which we do not, nor have we heard them. See, Peter right here is saying that Mary has messages that, she, that was not taught to him. Mary answered and said, What is hidden from you I will proclaim to you. And she began to speak to them from these words. I, she said, I saw the Lord in a vision, and I said to him, Lord, I saw you today in a vision. He answered and said to me, Blessed are you that did not waver at the sight of me, for where there is mind, there is the treasure. I said to him, Lord, how does he who sees the vision see it, through the soul or through the spirit? The Savior answered and said, He does not see through the soul nor through the spirit, but the mind that is between the two, that is what sees the vision. That's the Gospel of Mary, chapter 5. When Mary had said this, she fell silent, since it was to this point that the Savior had spoken with her. But Andrew answered and said to the brethren, Say what you wish to say about what she has said. I at least do not believe that the Savior said this, for certainly these, te these teachings are strange ideas. Peter answered and spoke concerning the same things. He questioned them about the Savior. Did he really speak privately with a woman and not openly to us? Are we to turn about and listen to her? Did he prefer her to us? Then Mary wept and said to Peter, My brother Peter, what do you think? Do you think that I have thought this up myself in my heart, or that I am lying about the Savior? Levi answered and said to Peter, Peter, you have always been hot-tempered. Now I will see. Now I see you contending against the women like the adversaries. But if the Savior made her worthy, who are you indeed to reject her? Surely the Savior knows her very well. That is why he loved her more than us. Rather than let us be ashamed and put on the perfect man and separate as he commanded us and preach the gospel, not laying down any other rule or other law beyond what the Savior said. And when they heard this, they began to go forth and proclaim and to preach. Gospel of Mary, chapter 9. So again, what we see here is that Mary has a vision. She's not preaching from Scripture. She's not preaching from Jesus' words. She has her own vision, the same as Paul did when he has his vision on the road to Damascus and converts uh, from Saul to Paul and becomes the Apostle Paul. Uh, you know, Paul has a, is very much of a Gnostic. I mean, the, the Gnostics saw Paul as the first of their kind. Um, and so these ideas of a personal revelation are, are that is the source of their teachings that, that they're not, there is no gospels. They're not, there is nothing written down. There is no, um, specific set of teachings. It's that it's, it's continually refreshed from continually new visions, but also at the same time you see in here that people are debating it. Um, Andrew says, I do not believe that the Savior said this, for certainly these teachings are strange ideas. And, and, and Peter says, similarly, did he really speak privately with a woman and not openly to us? Are we to turn, a, turn about and listen to her? So the men, both, um, both Andrew and Peter, are, are highly reluctant to listen to Mary. They don't trust her vision. Um, they don't trust her teachings. And they're you know, almost certainly hostile to her simply for the fact that she's a woman. So there is, um, you know, this, this, this 
contention is there from out of out of the out of the gate from 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 the word go in in early Christianity. You know, is it what's going to be the role of women? Um, what's going to be the role of Revelation? What's who's going to be the authority? You know, these are critical questions. Um, and what ends up happening was that you know the orthodoxy, as we know, they ended up prevailing. Um, the orthodoxy with their institutional authority, um, they were the ones who, who, who won out and they condemned everybody who did not think like them and anyone who did not bow to their authority were condemned and cast out of the church and ultimately cast out of society altogether. And so things like teachings of a divine mother or any of these pagan mystery tradition practices um, all get purged. So the women and their plant drugs get treated as, as witches. Um, women with an independent sexuality get branded as whores. Um, and we see centuries of persecution, literally centuries of persecution. Um, we go from a time when there was still ritual sex in temples at the time of Constantine, because we know from church fathers that Constantine closed some of these temples and that um, you know, we know we have centuries of, of condom, you know, and we have centuries of condemnation of prostitution. I mean, that goes on into the modern day. The idea that women would have independent sexualities is still seen as highly immoral, even though in different cultural contexts, it's not immoral at all. Um, and then the, the plant drugs, I mean, this gets branded as witchcraft. I mean, we have for centuries in the Middle Ages, both Catholics and Protestants murdered women by the thousand. We have, for three or four hundred years in the Middle Ages, only ending in the 1600s, um, there were these witch trials all over Europe uh, where women were rounded up and they were, anyone that was accused of witchcraft was, was tortured into, into a confession, which was then, uh, would get them executed. <laughs> and it was like 50, 60, 70, thousand, maybe more mostly women were sadistically brutalized, tortured, and executed in the most grisly fashion. Um, and for what? Um, you know, being accused of witches. But, you know, what were witches doing? They were, these were the village wise women. They were mixing up plant medicines um, and doing other stuff too. But, um, I mean, that that's the heart of it. It's, it's the, you know, it's the, it's the practitioners of these kinds of, you know, it would be considered magical practices, but really, you know, it, it, it's plant, it's a mixture of, of plant drugs and, 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 you know, different types of ritualistic prayers, you know, using crystals and what have you and talismans and, um, to try and, you know, affect the world, but you know, the plant drugs are at the heart of it. And, and that's, you know, this is where, you know, this is where the thought experiment comes in. You know, if, if the Gnostics had prevailed, if these types of notions of a, of respecting women and respecting women's traditions had prevailed, you know, the entire Western world would have a totally different flavor. Um, it wouldn't even be, it would not have been Christianity as we know it. Um, our, our ethics and morals and values, um, the day-to-day -day structure of our society would be completely different. Um, you know, would we have patriarchal nuclear families? Or, or would we have a different family arrangement? Would we have a different family structure? Um, would we have women in political roles and political leadership? Um, would we have, um, you know, a different relationship to nature? I mean, there's so many different things that would have been different if Christianity had taken a different form in the early centuries uh, than the one we got. That said, you know, we live in a, in a dynamic world where things continue to change. And we can we can reimagine these stories. I, I, I disagree with the atheists and the, and the, the, the rationalists and the secularists who, who want us to move to a world without religion. Um, I think we need new religion. I think we need to reinvent, reimagine these old stories. Uh, religious syncretism is one of humanity's oldest cultural traditions. We take the ideas that we like from anywhere and we bring them together and we shed the ideas that have that, that we don't like anymore or that have, that have lost their cachet, that have become um, no longer relevant to the time. And you shed those ideas that don't work. 
You keep what's good, shed what's bad, and like a snake shedding its skin, you're reborn for the next iteration of, of your going around the cycle. And so, to me, reacquainting ourselves with these old teachings can help us reimagine the world we want to have in the future because we need to be more active about imagining the world we're building right now because civilization's gone through the looking glass and we're living in very dangerous times as as everything changes and we don't know what's coming um, but we have to be intentional about the world we want to build otherwise we're going to end up with something that we don't plan on and unscrupulous people with power can take power over the rest of us unless the people are organized unless the people have communities that can that can withstand outside pressure and we need this and so I think that you know the mission of Lost Goddess IO is to help reacquaint people to these these very very ancient ideas of the Divine Mother these very ancient ideas um, you know that were purged out of the Christian West and purged with violence that we can bring these ideas back and that they are in, in, intention uh, incredibly insightful um, for the world we want to live in uh, so reacquainting ourselves with nature understanding the psychedelic experience elevating women to leadership positions um, reacquaint reconnecting to humanity's oldest traditions will help guide us as we charter as we go down un, into uncharted territory and we're we're you know blind people walking through the fog um, on a battlefield and it's um, but there's certain things we can anchor ourselves to that can help guide us and traditions that are thousands and thousands of years old that have been helped humanity for for eons can still help us again today and so it's worth digesting and, and meditating on, on these old teachings and I think that the um, the rediscovery of the Gnostic text is um, not been really appreciated for how wonderful that is because these teachings are so powerful and insightful so this is the end of the short story um, there's a bunch more on the website I've got a, an article I wrote on the swoon theory. So you can talk about, we can, you can check that out. I'll do another video on that sometime. And I've also got some of the entire uh, Gnostic Gospels. So I've got the entire Gospel of Thomas. And you can read it on the website here. So you don't have to take my word for it. Um, you can see which ones I used. And you can see all the quotes. They're actually not very long to read. The entire book is, you can read it in 20 minutes. It's not very long. Um, I've got the Gospel of Thomas and the Gospel of Philip, both of which are meant to be um, the sayings of Jesus. And they came from the Nog Hammadi Library. They were you know, hidden for 1,600 years. Um, I've got the uh, Gospel of Mary Magdalene on here. That actually did not come from the Nog Hammadi Library. It came from someplace else, but it was similarly um, old. It's very fragmented, so this is not very long. Um, and then I've got Thunder, Perfect Mind, which is actually just a poem. And this came from the Nog Hammadi Library. It does not mention Jesus. It's all about the Divine Mother. It's actually a poem written in the voice of the Divine Mother. It's quite powerful. I'll do another video on, on this one alone. Um, it's, uh, it's good stuff. So I put that on here. And these are by no means all of the Gnostic texts. There's much, much more material than, the, than these four books. These are just ones that, that I liked and that were relevant to what I was trying to do here. Um, there's much, much more out there. So you can read Elaine Pagel's book, The Gnostic Gospels. Um, and there's a lot of literature on, on the subject now at this point. So hope you enjoyed this. It's all a big thought experiment. It's just a chance to think and think in different terms. And uh, so I hope you like it. Uh, Edward Dodge, Lost Goddess IO. Uh, please like, share, and subscribe. And until uh, next time, uh, see you later.